discussed last week, and now it is official. On June 20th, the Department of Homeland Security posted federal register notices extending the temporary protected status designations for El Salvador, Honduras, Nepal, and Nicaragua for another 18 months. Now, temporary protected status beneficiaries under the four designations, they must re-register to maintain their temporary protected status throughout the 18-month extension. Individuals who arrived in the United States after the continuous residence dates for these designations, they are not eligible for TPS. The respective continuous residence dates are February 13th, 2001 for El Salvador, December 30th, 1998 for Honduras, June 24th, 2015 for Nepal, and December 30th, 1998 for Nicaragua. The rescission for the termination of the designations of these four countries for TPS became effective as of June 9th, 2023. So all four countries will get their temporary protected status extended. And you saw just by me saying these designation dates, TPS from El Salvador since 1998, in Honduras since the 90s. So those people have been in, in, in immigration limbo for a generation. And we talk about getting DACA recipients who've also been in uh, immigration limbo for a long time. Equally as important is getting an amnesty for people in TPS. I mean, you give people temporary protected status here for a generation and they, they, they're in limbo for a generation. And at some point, it's not fair. You just got to give people green cards at some point. Uh, because unless, you know, somebody knows that they can permanently reside here for the rest of their lives, you know, you can say, oh, my God, I'm going to buy a car, I'm going to buy a house. And then what, hap what happens if they deport me the next day? So it's, you know, extraordinarily unfair what the government's doing to people. So I hope not besides, and we, we say this all the time, the DACA recipients, the TPS recipients as well. Government's telling you you can legally stay here for 18-month increments for a generation already. It's time to give them amnesty. On June 12, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services announced the expansion of premium processing, that is expedited processing for applicants filing to extend or change their immigrant status to students on either an F visa, an M visa, or a J visa. So F, M, and J, you can now expedite your change of status. Online, and you do it by online filing a form I-907, Request for Premium Processing Services, the premium processing expansion for certain Form I-539 applicants. That the Form I-539 is, is the form to file for your extension or change of status. That's going to occur in phases, and non-immigrants requesting premium processing should not file before these dates. So here are the dates. USCIS will reject premium processing requests for a pending Form I-539 received before June 13th. USCIS will reject premium processing requests when filed together with a Form I-539 if USCIS received the request before June 26th. Now, here's an important reminder. You must submit the Form I-907. That's the form to expedite your change of status or extension of status on student visa status. The same way you submit your request for the extension. So for example, if you requested your extension by paper, you're going to request your expedite by paper. And if you requested your extension of time or change of status by uh, the computer online, you're also going to request your expedite also online. Now the expedite promises a decision within 15 days, but 15 days from when? 15 days from the time you take your biometrics. So you first have to submit to your biometrics and your fingerprints, and thereafter, they promise a decision within 15 days. On Friday, June 23rd, the Supreme Court ruled that Texas and Louisiana do not have standing to sue the Biden administration over an immigration deportation policy delivering a win for the Biden administration, an eight to one ruling. Now, for those who don't know what standing means, besides standing on your feet, standing means that you have skin in the game. That when you say you have skin in the game, meaning that there that you're going to be affected by whatever may happen. And though the court cautioned, that doesn't mean the White House couldn't be sued in future cases by states. In this particular case, they couldn't. 
So in U.S. versus Texas, it concerned Texas's and Louisiana's legal challenge against the Biden immigration policy outlined in September 2021 that prioritized some undocumented immigrants for deportation over others. And what did they prioritize? The Biden administration said, we're only going to deport people who are criminals or terrorists. That's it. You're not a criminal. You're not a terrorist. We're going to leave you alone. And Texas and Louisiana said, that's crazy. We want to deport everybody. And Biden says, well, we don't have the resources to deport everybody. So who we're going to deport is criminals and terrorists. That's it. And the Supreme Court ruled Texas and Louisiana, as I said, did not have standing to challenge that policy. And they reinstated that Biden administration policy that from now on, at least throughout the rest of the Biden administration, I mean, maybe you'll trip over immigration somewhere. They're only going to deport people they find at the border. They're only going to deport people within the United States of America that have a criminal record or uh, are suspected terrorists. Justice Brett Kavanaugh wrote in the court's opinion that the Supreme Court ruling doesn't mean that federal courts may never entertain cases involving the executive branch's alleged failure to make more arrests or bring more prosecutions, noting that there are other situations in which it is possible that the states would have standing. And there might be more of a case challenging policies around detaining undocumented immigrants who have been arrested rather than arresting and prosecuting them in the first place. The Biden administration directive at the heart of the case argues that someone not being a documented immigrant should not alone be the basis for an enforcement action against them, meaning be put in deportation, arguing that the majority of undocumented non-citizens who could be subject to removal have been contributing members of our communities for years. So what does that mean? It means that unless you are a criminal, unless you are caught at the border, or unless you are a suspected terrorist, you should be okay. What does that mean for Florida? The same thing. Governor Ron DeSantis can't do jack you know what to you. He is only a governor. Only President Biden, the executive branch, can decide who to deport. So Florida can report all the people they want to immigration. And based on this policy in the Biden administration, unless you're a criminal, unless you're a terrorist, you should be okay. Or a court at the border, you should be okay. So the memo for enforcement will go into effect immediately. And this is exactly what the memo says. It states the Biden administration will prioritize for deportation undocumented immigrants who pose threats to national security by being suspected of terrorism or espionage, have a history of criminal conduct that makes them a threat to public safety, or poses a threat to border security if they were apprehended at the border or port of entry. Drop mic. All the governors in any state can report you till the cows come home. But if immigration's not going to enforce deportation against you, you have nothing to worry about. Everyone in Florida breathe clearly now. According to data released Thursday on June 22nd by the Census Bureau, the median age in the United States reached a record high of 38.9 in 2022. Now that's a rapid rise. In 2000, the median age was 35. In 1980, the median age was 30. That means the nation is not getting younger. It's getting older. Now, 38 is an unusually high median age for the United States. The average person in the United States is 38 years old. If aliens came from outer space and landed at the White House and they went to President Biden and they said, President Biden, show us your most typical American, you're going to find a 38-year-old. The new data adds to the evidence that, like many European and Asian nations, the United States is graying, posing challenges for the workforce, the economy, and social programs. Andrew Baveridge, president of Social Explorer, a demographic data firm, said it's simple arithmetic. Fewer kids are being born. Birth rates fell steeply in the first year or so of the coronavirus pandemic. Since then, they've ticked up a little bit. But still, since the beginning of the Great Recession in 2007, Fertility has remained very low compared with previous generations. The trend is international 
even affecting countries with much stronger social programs in the United States, like Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Across industrialized nations, women of the millennial generation, they're more likely to prioritize education and work in their 20s, leading them to marry older and having fewer children. What's the oldest state? Maine, 44.8 years old, with New Hampshire following second at 43.3 years old. Who got the young ones? Utah, 31.9 years old is the average in Utah. That's surprising. I wouldn't have known that. Well, I guess maybe. District of Columbia, 34.8 in D.C. is the average age. And the third youngest state is Texas at 35.5 years old. Kenneth Johnson, a demographer at the University of New Hampshire, says the new census data covers the period up to July 22nd. And it shows the American population is older than it ever has been. And the nation remains still younger than Europe, where the median age is 44 years old. According to a new analysis from the American Immigration Council of Data from the 2021 American Community Survey, immigrants, many of whom are women, make up a significant portion of the United States population. In 2021, 23.2 million Immigrant women lived in the United States, outnumbering immigrant men, according to recent analysis of the 2021 American Community Survey. Immigrant women made up 14% of the country's overall female population. And while their work adds critical value to our economy and society, immigrant women in the labor force earn less than foreign-born men, and they earn less than U.S.-born men, and they earn less than U.S.-born women. Immigrant women of the four populations, U.S.-born men, U.S.-born women, immigrant men, immigrant women, immigrant women make the least amount of money and are the largest uh, percentage of immigrants in the United States. Immigrant women from Mexico make up the largest share, 22% of the female immigrant population. About 5.1 million women from Mexico live in the United States, followed by India, Philippines, and China. And more than 54.8% of immigrant women were naturalized U.S. citizens in 2021, though naturalization rates differ by country of origin. Of the 12.7 million immigrant women in the United States labor force, many occupy roles across the occupational spectrum, accounting for 16% of all female workers in the United States. And while immigrant women work in a variety of fields, more than one in five immigrant women work in healthcare and social assistance industry, followed by female immigrants working in professional services and hospitality. Women from the Philippines play a vital role in healthcare and social assistance in the United States, with 42% of the women from the Philippines working in this one industry alone. And when the Biden administration announced in July of 2021 a new immigration court program in Boston, top officials promised it would make asylum cases faster and fairer. But according to local advocates and a new report from an immigration clinic at Harvard Law School that provides the first detailed review of Boston's expedited program called the Dedicated Docket, those promises are far from being fulfilled. The report found that migrants assigned to Boston's fast track program are more likely to be ordered deported, less likely to be represented by an attorney, and less likely to prevail in an asylum case compared to those were funneled into Boston's regular immigration court. A key problem, the report concluded, and I've been saying this for years, is that migrants assigned to the new program struggle to secure legal representation. They can't get lawyers because the hearings are coming too fast and the whole case is completed in less than 300 days. And only a fraction of those cases were actually completed quickly. Fewer than 4,000 out of the 20,000 were actually completed within the time frame they were supposed to be completed within 300 days. So what's 300 days? 10 months. And the vast majority of these completed cases either ended in deportation order or were dismissed because prosecutors failed to file necessary paperwork because prosecutors couldn't even keep up with the paperwork. And what that would that do? It left everybody in undocumented limbo, either undocumented or living here with orders of deportation. Advocates, including the authors of the Harvard report, wrote in a letter sent to the Biden administration Thursday on June 22nd, saying the administration has now had two years to make good on its promise 
of a dedicated docket that delivers both efficient and fair proceedings to families seeking asylum. The dedicated docket in Boston is one of 11 fast-tracked immigration programs set up by the Biden administration, but the one in Boston is the world's worst, or at least the country's worst. It is also the country's biggest docket program, with between 13,000 and 19,000 pending cases as of January being processed on an expedited basis. Now, the docket flips the usual order of immigration court proceedings, under regular circumstances, new deportation cases go to the back of the line and are scheduled based on judges' availability, and sometimes it takes two, three years to process. But the dedicated docket bypasses that process, prioritizing the newly arrived families with the goal of getting them in and out quickly and sending a signal to would-be migrants that entering the United States without authorization will not guarantee a long stay in the country. But migrant advocates have warned that such a speedy system risks rushing migrants through life-altering legal proceedings before they can even find a lawyer and prepare their asylum claim. For years, advocates for migrants decried similar programs implemented by Obama and Trump, saying they were unfair. One issue emphasized in the report, and by immigration attorneys, is that many migrant families end up in the dedicated docket without even realizing it. In other words, they don't even know they're there. Notices to appear for court hearings were often sent to outdated addresses or not even sent at all. And then when migrants failed to appear for hearings, judges sometimes ordered them removed from the country in absentia. And the report documents 1,177 in absentia deportation orders in the last 12 months on the dedicated docket in Boston. In Boston alone. The Biden administration said it chose Boston for a dedicated docket because of the area's established communities of legal service providers. But in a letter sent to the Justice Department in June 2021, advocates said the plan was based on a faulty assumption that legal aid was plentiful in Boston because it is not. The Harvard report found that migrants who did not have legal representation, migrants who did not have lawyers, migrants who did not have lawyers standing up for them, fared significantly worse than migrants who showed up with a lawyer. During the first year of the dedicated docket, a mere 205 applications for asylum were approved in Boston. What did all 205 approved applications have in common? They were all of these migrants were represented by lawyers. Of all of the cases where the migrants were not represented by lawyers, there was a total of zero approvals. The Biden administration has stopped taking mobile app appointments to admit asylum seekers at a Texas border crossing that connects to a notoriously dangerous Mexican city after advocates warned U.S. authorities that migrants were being targeted there for extortion. U.S. Customs and Border Protection gave no explanation for its decision to stop scheduling new appointments via the CBP-1 app for the crossing into Laredo, Texas. Several asylum seekers told the Associated Press that Mexican officials in Nuevo Laredo, right across the border from Laredo, Texas. Uh, it's Laredo, Texas and New Laredo, I guess. Had threatened to hold them, had threatened to hold them and make them miss their scheduled asylum appointments unless they were paid. Humanitarian groups in Laredo said that they had recently warned Customs and Border Patrol of the problems and that certain groups were controlling access to the international crossing on the Mexican side. So basically, we have basically uh, uh, some combination of uh, mobsters, hoodlums, and gangs basically charging people just to cross over and keep their appointment. So I guess a second illegal checkpoint set up by mobsters and hoodlums and gangs. Now, migrant advocates say the situation in Nuevo Laredo, which is plagued by cartel fighting and other problems, cast doubt on the administration's argument that Mexico is safe for people to wait for their asylum appointment for the United States. It's not. Rafael Alvarez, 29 years old, who fled Venezuela, said that he landed in Nuevo Laredo in early June. Mexican immigration authorities at the airport seized his travel documents, including a printout of the email confirming his CBP-1 appointment, and demanded he pay 1,000 Mexican pesos, it's about $57, just to get his documents back. 
So these are actual Mexican authorities, police officers. He was held with other migrants, Alvarez said, and they would tell us covertly, you're going to put the money in this envelope and pass it to us. Uh, and if they didn't do that, they were being held. And I am sure this $57 was not authorized by the Mexican government. The officials, he said, threatened to hold them so they would have their appointments canceled. Alvarez, whose appointment was the next day, said he refused to pay and was eventually released. But five Russians who were held with him paid a total of 5,000 pesos, about $290. They initially were asked to fork over double that amount, but they told officials they did not have that much. Alvarez said other Venezuelan friends who flew to Nuevo Laredo in late May also paid to have their documents returned to them. Thousands of asylum seekers are now stuck on the Mexican border towns waiting until they can get an appointment to seek refuge in the United States after being blocked during the COVID pandemic. And earlier this month, the Mexican newspaper El Universal published video it obtained that was taken from a bus window showing a federal Mexican agent, a Mexican agent working for the federal Mexican government, taking bills from migrants and stuffing them in his pocket as he checked passports in the Pacific coast town of Jalisco. The agency said it had suspended two of its agents there and it does not tolerate the rights of migrants being violated. The newspaper also obtained government documents through a freedom of information request that showed the agency had opened 119 investigations in Mexico against agents between 2017 and 2023 for misconduct. And that's probably just the uh, cherry on the top of a much greater, greater problem in Mexico. There's rescuers race to find a handful of billionaires and very wealthy people and an explorer who vanished after launching a mission to take a look at the Titanic. Another disaster at sea that's feared to have left hundreds of people dead was swept under the spotlight. Last week's sinking of a fishing boat crowded with migrants trying to get from Libya to Italy sparked arrests, violent protests, and questions about authorities' failure to act or find a long-term solution to the migrant issue. But many human rights advocates are extraordinarily frustrated that the world seems to have already moved on from this terrible tragedy and that the resources and the media spotlight was dedicated to the Titan rescue efforts, which far outweigh those for the sunken migrant ship. Judith Sunderland, Associate Director for Human Rights Watch Europe and Central Asia Division, said in a telephone interview, it is horrifying and disgusting contrast. Reflecting on the apparent disparities in resources and media attention on the two crises, she said the willingness to allow certain people to die while every effort is made to save others, it's a, you know, really dark reflection on humanity. And when you think about it, she is 100% right. And Sutherland wasn't alone in raising concerns over disparities in attention and resources dedicated to the search for the crew of explorers aboard the missing submersible named the Titan. Compared with the deadly shipwreck that happened around the same time last week of a vessel carrying hundreds of migrants and asylum seekers. The front pages the past few days have been dominated by the search for the missing sub, said Jose Norton, co-founder and CEO of Choose Love a United Kingdom-based non-governmental organization supporting refugees around the world. She said thousands more articles appeared to have been published about the submersible than about the migrant boat, yet it's 100 times as many people who are feared to have lost their lives, and, and these people, they were forced to flee their homes, were just looking for safety. A fishing boat carrying migrants trying to reach Europe capsized and sank off of Greece on Wednesday, authorities said. At least 79 people are dead, hundreds more missing. It's one of the worst disasters of its kind, not only this year, but in any year. The search for the Titan was a race against time as the oxygen supply dwindled on the vessel, which has been missing since it lost contact with its mothership, the Polar Prince, an hour and 45 minutes after launching its dive early on Sunday, June 18th. The U.S. Coast Guard had said that 96 hours worth of oxygen is available, and with the support of agencies and other nations, the Coast Guard raced to find the vessel and its passengers who were identified as Stockton Rush, the CEO of Ocean Gate Expeditions, the company behind the mission. 
British billionaire Amish Harding, owner of Action Aviation, French dive expert Paul Henry Nagolo, and prominent Pakistani businessman Shazda Dawood and his son Suleiman. On Thursday, debris from the Titan was found, and it was presumed that all of them had passed. There was a story on 60 Minutes, which is seen on CBS News, that Russia is attacking, obviously, civilians in Ukraine with new waves of missiles. You see it in the, in the paper every day. It's a relentless assault uh, that the United Nations has called a war crime. But even before Russia's invasion, more than a thousand Ukrainian children were already at war and they were at war fighting cancer. And as 60 Minutes first reported last winter, Russian attacks on hospitals and the power grid put these fragile children in immediate danger. Olena Zelensk, the first lady of Ukraine, asked the world for help and a renowned American hospital in 21 countries answered the call. And what followed was an improvised flight to safety that Ukraine called the Convoy of Life. Olena Zelenska spoke with the first ladies of other countries. She said for this convoy to work, they needed to set up the system in their countries, making sure that physicians and hospitals in their country would accept the children for treatment. Jill Biden responded for the United States, Bridget Macron for France, Agata Duda for Poland and many others. They helped activate charities and medical societies. An improvised triage center in Poland set up by an American hospital, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, named for the patron saint of hopeless causes. Dr. Marta Salik of St. Jude, who helped organize the triage center in an empty hotel in the Polish countryside, said the children would get escorted from Lvov to the border so they didn't have to wait in line. And then they would cross the border into Poland. And the children who were sick would go straight to the hospital with an ambulance, sometimes a helicopter. And the ones that were stable would take this really impressive medical train that had medical staff. And they had an ICU and a surgical theater. And they would take this train to a city called Kalis that was close to where our Unicorn Clinic was. And the Unicorn Clinic was the name that they gave to the hotel that could hold 300 patients and their families from the Ukraine. Medical records were translated and hospitals found for treatment at no charge in 21 welcoming countries. The mass evacuation of children with cancer ran last spring from March through May. By recent count, the Convoy of Life evacuated 1,300 children into a welcoming world, allowing their families to fight one war at a time. Roxalina Samaras, the mother of two-year-old Melanie was fighting cancer and knew her family had to escape Ukraine. In February, her mother, Roxalina Samarez, joined the jam of thousands of refugees struggling to cross into Poland. They are now living in St. Jude in Memphis, Tennessee. Roxalana told 60 Minutes, there's hope that Melania can be cured of her fibrosarcoma, a cancer of the connective tissue in her leg. She said, we fled the war from people who just wanted to kill and hear people are greeting you and want to give you the best help. Wherever I go, I want to say thank you to every person that I meet. I feel like I want to scream out loud to everyone. Thank you. America gave this to us. and I would like to have a chance to help others too, so that people believe that kindness wins. We need to do more good things. It's a great story. This story shows that help and support can come from people of all ages. An elementary school student from South Brunswick, New Jersey, wants to make it easier for those who are just coming to the United States. Third grader Avery Ryan of Cambridge Elementary School has spearheaded a pillow and blanket drive to her school. She was able to collect 82 pillows and five blankets, and the items are headed to a group that helps immigrants and refugees. Ryan says that she started to drive because she had an Afghan refugee living in her house. And she said that she noticed they didn't have a pillow. And I feel like even though we're not part of their family, we still need to help people, she said. And Ryan's teachers say that it's important to teach all students to be kind and helpful to others. Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.